Hello, my name is Bethany Fichter, and I am your new University Archivist at DePaul University. Today, I'm going to be showing you some of my favorite items from the archives that are not often accessible to faculty, staff, students, and the general public. So I hope you enjoy this tour that I give you today. So the first item that I'd like to show you is a petition um, from the citizens of Rockville, Indiana. And you might be asking, why am I showing you this petition? Well, there were several cities in our state that were interested in establishing um, a higher education institution uh, for the Methodist community. And Rockville was one of those cities. Um, other cities included Indianapolis, Putnamville, Lafayette, Madison, and then of course Greencastle. So Methodist leaders in the 1830s had um, looked at our state and realized that you know, there wasn't a higher education institution that specifically had the founding Methodist principles, but there were Presbyterian um, higher education institutions such as Hanover, um, Wabash College, and the Indiana Academy or College what we now know today as Indiana University Bloomington. So these Methodist leaders had um, reached out to the Indiana General Assembly and had suggested that possibly there was a relationship that could have been formed with Indiana University, or the Academy, and this Methodist higher education institution. And it was a failed attempt. So they redid their drawing boards and came up with two committees. The first committee was to create a charter that would later go to the Indiana General Assembly to approve this institution, um, Asbury, uh, Indiana Asbury University. And the second committee was then to find the most ideal location. Now we all know that Green Castle was the final resting place for DePaul, what we know as DePaul University today. But it's interesting that Rockville and their petition um, was equally similar. Um, the one thing that really brought forth Green Castle was a monetary exception. So Green Castle offered up $25,000, and at that time that would have been a lot of money. Um, Rockville did not have the same bid, um, but they did cite the overall healthfulness of their area and, of course, the proximity to the Wabash River. Um, the Wabash Erie um, Canal would have been a very popular transportation unit at that time. So it would have been really great for faculty, staff, students, parents to come to and, and from Rockville. This next item I brought today um, is one of the first documents um, after Indiana Asbury University was formed. And it's a really small document, um, but it's a great one and that we have something to look forth, uh, forward um, to as far as what exercises had taken place at that time. So we did some research on some of the individuals that were a part of this exercise. One of them was an early Methodist leader, um, William Ballot. He was part of the original board of trustees and would have been a visitor. Two of the presenters were students and they were part of the first um, Asbury class. One of them, um, his name is Marcus Talbot. We were able to find some um, really cool information about him and his studies at the time um, at Asbury. But notably, also Elijah Cowgill, which many in the Greencastle area are familiar with due to the city offices that he had later held in Greencastle, um, as well as several paintings that can be found um, within this, the city. So I think it would be really neat um, if we were able to do further research on this document because you'll notice that several musical pieces had been um, taken place during this exercise. And um, it, it would be really fun to recreate um, this exercise in, in the future. Um, it's very similar to an invocation or a convocation that you would see on campus today. So it's pretty cool that we have this document and we're able to relate back to it in time. So you might be wondering why I have these white cotton gloves on. Um, and the reasoning for this is because I have brought out some photographs. And one thing that we tend to do is wear, wear white gloves whenever we're working with photographs so that our fingerprints 
don't end up smudging um, and ruining any photographic surfaces. That's not the case when we're working with text-based documents. Often the paper types, um, you'll actually do more damage having the cotton gloves on. So I wanted to make sure that explanation was apparent um, so that you know why I have these white gloves on. Well, moving along, um, the edifice. We get a lot of questions um, surrounding the edifice. It was the first building on Asbury's campus. It was constructed in 1840. So we consider this one of the earliest photographs that we have in our collection of what is now DePaul University. Now, sadly, the edifice caught fire in February of 1879. And these images here show fire marshals or cadets on their way in to try to put out this very large fire. Um, unfortunately, most of the interior had um, been dissolved because of, of the fire that had broke out, but the exterior walls stood. And I, I wanted to bring out this special case um, from the collection. This would have been um, a piece of wood from the original steps that would have been within the edifice that managed to make it out of the fire. Um, I like to show this to students and, and faculty, staff, alumni whenever they, they visit um, so they can see uh, the actual artifacts in person. I think it helps, you know, well round um, the, the picture because the photographs are two dimensional, but when you bring in three dimensional objects, it just really brings the story to life. So after the fire, the exterior walls had made it um, and they decided to reconstruct. Eight months later, they were on the building path and formed West College. So not too many people are familiar with West College because it was the in-between building, right? So you first had the edifice, and then after the West College, you have where we're standing right now, which is Royal West Library. West College housed a gymnasium, library, museum, um, and armory at the time. Um, military training, encampment area, um, as well as an alumni hall. So it was a mixed, you know, multi-purpose building at the time, um, but it was raised in 1934 due to unsafe conditions. So now we have the Royal West Library and it's a fixture on campus. And next time you're here, maybe you'll take a look back and realize that the edifice our first building um, on DePaul's campus once stood here, as well, well as uh, West College. So this next grouping of items is probably one of my favorites that I've learned here. Um, you know, I've only been here for 10 months, and it's been a lot of information to digest within the pandemic, but I am definitely a pet lover. And I was really happy to know that many of the students and the faculty are also pet lovers now, but also historically speaking. So Jack the dog, um, beloved pet friend on campus during the 1890s. He showed up in 1892 and did not belong to one student, um, you know, staff or faculty member or student organization. He belonged to everyone. Um, Jack would be fed by scraps, you know, he would be on the steps of local businesses in downtown Greencastle. Um, he'd entertain during classes, he would be involved in sporting events. Um, he was just there all the time. So a couple hours had passed and students realized that Jack was missing. And, you know, he was everywhere and he was a black dog, he's Border Collie Lab mix, so it's kind of hard to miss. <laughs> you can see a, a portrait of him right here. Students formulated a plan because they thought for sure a rivalry institution had come in and taken Jack. And sure enough, they disguised themselves and they went to this rivalry institution and they found Jack. Brought him back safe and sound. Sadly, in 1896, Jack passed away and they think by poisoning. We do not have documentation of this poisoning in our collection, but it is noted in our class bulletins as well as the yearbook. But in true DePauw fashion, the students had a farewell celebration of his life in May Harry Hall in East College, where there were several students that presented, the university band had played, and they bid their farewell to him, burying him on the south lawn of East College. This next item that I brought out for you, 
It's titled The Sombrero and it's dated 1908. And you're probably wondering, what is the sombrero? Well, it's a yearbook um, that was published by the junior class. And, um, you know, it's one of those funny ones, right? Because most of the yearbooks are either named the, the Mirror or Mirage. Uh, in fact, all of them are named the Mirror or the Mirage. So why the sombrero? Um, at the time, this would have been the class garb. Um, the hats were Edwardian in style. Um, you would have also seen women wearing handkerchiefs um, in red. Um, so it kind of became a fashion statement. And I think the junior class selected the sombrero really as an ode to the time period. Um, you know, DePaul students are super creative. They like to think outside of the box. And these students probably wanted to do something just a little bit different to shake things up as a memoriam um, to the, the class and, and what all the events that had taken place during those years. I also really love the illustrations um, within this because of the time period. So Art Nouveau would have been in style and it's very stylistic um, for that time. But one of my favorite things to show is found in the back here. And it is actually an image of some students um, bidding their farewell. And you'll notice the sombrero type hat. And then if you look really closely, and you can also see the snake shifts as well. One thing that's really great about the pause yearbooks and the archives in particular is that we have done a really great job of digitizing all of them. And they've been made available um, via our digital library. And I often like to tell people to go and check them out because if you are a history buff or you're just super interested in, in DePaul and want to see photographs of you and your friends or learn more about events that, you know, had taken place, all of that can be found online. And it's very easy to get wrapped up in it and chase yourself down into a, a rabbit hole. Um, so definitely take advantage of those resources that we've made available to you um, that you can view in your own home. So this next item, um, it is called Lectora Super Secundum Partum Libri Sexti Decretalium, and it is Latin, but it is a primary reading from the second part of the Sixth Papal Ruling. So this is a law or decree from the Catholic Church. And what's important about this book is that it is the oldest book in the Royal West Library. And um, it was printed in 1477. And notably, if you think back to the printing press and the early printing of books, um, the Gutenberg Bible would have been printed in 1455. So doing a little bit of math, this book would have been um, printed 22 years after the Gutenberg Bible. Now, we call this an incunable which means from the cradle of printing or the infancy of printing. And these are all things that would have been printed before the 1501 time frame. I love to show this book because of the binding. Um, it's actually um, seen better days. I can take this cover off. Uh, this cover is made of oak and it's been bound in leather. You'll notice the brass bosses on the front as well as the back sides. These would have helped with stacking um, because back in the day, books would have been stored horizontally versus vertically, and this was to protect the outer covers. There's also remnants of what would have been clasped to keep these books shut. And um, once you take this cover off, it's interesting because you can start to see some of the stitching patterns. And I like to tell folks, you know, not is it that this is the oldest book in the library, but there's also craftsmanship behind this book. And there's not going to be any other book that's identical to this one, which is what makes it so unique. Now, I wanted to point out that within the text, you'll notice hand colored initials and illustrations. The red would have been a mixture um, formed primarily with uh, red lead. The blues from lapis lazuli. And then the blacks 
from a charcoal or soot mixture. I've also pulled out some pages here where the illustrator, really fancy, <laughs> decided to make some um, higher quality, I think, illustrations than in some other books. Um, but this is often um, known as rubrication. So, you know, artists, illustrators at that time would have um, made items more prominent by using inks and um, illustrating more flourishly or flourishing um, throughout. And that was really just a staple to let the reader know that this is a very important part of this text within the book. This book is also unique in that the, the gutters paneling along the sides are very large and it made it really special then for somebody to come through later on in time and mark up their own notes which can be found throughout the book. Now you might be wondering what's going on with the holes that are found throughout and that's because it's probably been visited by a bookworm throughout its lifetime and it's just it's a typical thing that happens over time and it's, it's also another really fun thing to point out with these older texts. So the last items that I have to show you today is a special request from the Alumni Engagement Office. And these are two bound volume set, the poems of Osian. And what makes these very special, and maybe you already know as a former student, is that these books are haunted. They are from our James Whitcomb collection. James Whitcomb was a former governor of the state of Indiana from 1843 to 1848. And when he donated his special collection to the library, he wanted these to not circulate, um, so not move outside of the library walls. In the early 1900s, a student wanted to see the poems of Osian, um, but he wanted to take them home to read. And he did, and it's thought that the ghost visited him in the middle of the night. A shadowy figure appeared above his bed, and what he believed was it was Governor Whitcomb saying, Osian, Osian, who stole my Osian? Well, it obviously scared the boy, <laughs> and he decided he wasn't going to go back to sleep that evening and return the book to the library first thing in the morning, where the story was told to a library and a staff member. So we keep this book um, within our stacks. It's a non-circulating collection, so we are honoring the wishes of the former governor, but it's up to you to decide you know, whether or not this is true. Um, we like to think that it's a friendly ghost and we will honor any ghost that likes to come and protect our treasures here on campus. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on this archival tour. We hope that you can come and visit us in person very soon, but because we all know that you're keeping socially distanced, you can definitely keep track of us online. You can find us on Facebook at DePaul University Archives, or on Instagram at DePaul underscore archives for a little bit more fun. So thank you, stay safe and take care.